All right, everyone, welcome back. Nice to see you again. Or, you know what I mean. Anyway, um, today we're going to talk about standard normal curve, finding z-scores in areas. Um, this is within module 8. This is one of the big, um, you know, topics that we're going to look at that's going really going to lead to some interesting things in the later chapters, later modules. So uh, pay, pay close attention. And again, feel free to pause the video at any time. If there's any problems that I don't do, pause the video, try the problems, and then use the PowerPoint to check your answers. So we talked about the normal distribution earlier in the course. And remember that you're essentially talking about a bell curve here. So one of the things you're going to want to do is practice drawing the x-axis and then draw the bell curve. It's not going to be perfect, but try to make it symmetric. And remember that the mode here is also the mean, so we usually call that x bar. So the population mean could be called mu. And then these values are represented by all the data values that are less than the mean. Because remember that numbers that are less than a number go to the left on the number line. These data values are numbers that are larger than x bar. So here's an example of a normal curve here that is representing by the height and then the relative frequency. So you can probably guess since the mean looks somewhere around 64 to 65 inches and as you know 64 inches is 5 feet 4 inches. So you can probably guess which population we're talking about here. You guessed it. It's adult women. And you could generalize or you could say adult women in, in the United States. Um, the average height for men is slightly higher than that. Maybe 5 foot 7, 5 foot 8 I believe. I'd have to check on that. So anyway, um, keep in mind that normal distributions have all different shapes and sizes, but one thing they have in common, a couple things that they have in common, is that they are symmetric, bell-shaped, okay, and they have a mean and a standard deviation. Remember that mu means the population mean and sigma means the population standard deviation. All right, so normal curves can take on many appearances and many different means and standard deviations as is characterized by this graph here. Okay, so to start things off, we want to talk about the standard normal curve. The standard normal curve is the distribution that specifically has a mean value of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. And on this normal curve, we can identify what we call z-scores. Z-scores are very simply the number of standard deviations above or below the mean which is 0. So for example, if z is 1, then we're talking about one standard deviation above the mean. Right? If z is negative 1, then that would be one standard deviation below the mean. <coughs> so this right here is your standard normal distribution. Your mean is 0. Your standard deviation is 1. So here's a review question. How many values approximately are between negative 1 and 1? From the empirical rule from the last exam, you remember that that's 68%. Oops, 68% here. And then 95% in between negative 2 and 2, and 99.7 within three standard deviations. So this is the same normal curve, except that it has a very special value of 0 for the mean and 1 for the standard deviation. 
So as I mentioned, symmetric and bell-shaped. The mean is zero, standard deviation is one, and the total area under the curve equals one. And this is something I'm going to, um, there's also another one, but I'm going to talk about that in a second. This is something I'm going to mention many, many times in the class. Um, so forgive me if I repeat myself like a broken record, but the area under the curve is the same as percentages, which is the same as probabilities. So probability, percentage, and area are all interchangeable when we're talking about the uh, normal distribution or standard normal distribution. Okay, so just remember that. All right, and then the last thing is that the x-axis, which this here is the x-axis, is what was called a horizontal asymptote. And what that means is that the negative probability values don't exist. We already know that. We know that the probability of any event is in between negative 1 and 1, which, excuse me, is in between 0 and 1. I'm mistaking, I'm mixing this up with trigonometry, forgive me, um, <laughs> which means that negative values do not exist. There are no negative probability values. So that means that nothing is going to go below the axis. So in order to standardize a normal curve, you know, most normal curves don't have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. This is how we modify, this is how we calculate what's called the z-score. So in the example we gave earlier where um, we had women's height, um, let's say that you have a women's, a woman is um, 67 inches tall. That's her value, that's x. And then we would have to figure out what the mean and standard deviation was from that bell curve. So if I go back to there, right here, we see that the mean is about 64 or 65. So let's, for the, for the sake of it, let's just say 64. And let's, oh, excuse me, there it is right there. The mean is 64.4 and the standard is 2.4. So 64.4 and 2.4, all right. So 64.4, and 2.4. So if we were trying to figure out the z-score of, let's say her name is Alice. The z-score for Alice would simply be her height minus the population of women's standard deviation, or excuse me, the population of women's average height in inches divided by the population standard deviation. So we could do 67, actually let's do paren, 67 minus 64.4, close paren, divided by 2.4. Oops, I must have hit a, a bad key on the, oh yeah, so this would be a minus sign right there. There we go. I hit it on the keyboard and it didn't like that. So 1.083 bar. Now when we round z-scores, we do it to the second decimal place, so 1.08. So we'll say 1.08. So think about what that means for a second in terms of Alice's height. What that means is that Alice's, Alice's height is about one standard deviation above the mean. That's what the z-score does. It calculates, it gives you a score as it relates to the, the average and the standard deviation height of women. So again, we call this a z-score. Okay. And if we were to take a look at the standard normal, this is the standard normal curve. Um, excuse me, this is the normal distribution. This is a generic normal curve where we just have mean. And this is the standard normal curve because the mean is zero. And if you have a value here A and if you have a value B, their z-scores 
respectively would be z sub a, which is a minus mu divided by sigma, and z sub b, which is b minus mu divided by sigma. sigma. So essentially what we're doing is we're taking the normal curve here and we're turning it into the standard normal curve by normalizing the, the values using that formula. Okay, so a couple more examples here. So let's say that we have a mean of 48, standard deviation of 5, convert to a standard normal curve and indicate where a score of 45 would be. One of the things you're going to want to do each time is draw the picture. I know it gets tedious, but do it anyway. So draw the picture. Just do the best you can. And the mean is 48. And the standard deviation is 5. So one standard deviation below would get you to 43. So 45 would be about right there. Right? So that is the value that we are looking at. So the question is, you know, what's the z-score? So of course the formula we would use is z is equal to 45, which is x, minus 48, which is the mean, divided by 5? Yeah, 5 which gives us a z-score of negative 0.6. So the z-score for x is negative 0 0.60, since we're doing two decimal places, which means that it's 6 tenths of a standard deviation below the mean. So there it's drawn a little bit nicer for you on sort of graph paper. So we've got the, stand we've got the normal followed by the standard normal curves here. And you can identify the, the value of 45, like I did up above. And there's the formula. So there's the fraction version, or the decimal version for you. Okay. And this is blocked out here, but uh, let me erase that. There we go. So you can see that again, the negative 0.6. So there's the z-score. So once again, this is the z standard normal distribution, and this is the actual normal distribution of the values looking there. And just use your normal, you know, common sense when it comes to number line stuff. Stuff to the right is bigger, stuff to the left is smaller. So again, negative 0 0.60 means that many standard deviations below the mean, which is about a little over a half of a standard deviation below the mean. All right, so the individual z-score is important, but it doesn't really tell us anything. So if I go back to the example we were just on, if I was to ask you, actually, let's go back to the other example for the weight. So Alice's height, not weight, but height. Oops, I went too far. So when we calculated Alice's z-score, um, what that tells you is where Alice stands, no pun intended, uh, in relation to the rest of the population of women. But what's more interesting would be, you know, to say, okay, if I randomly selected someone, what's the probability that they would be as the same height as Alice. And interestingly enough, this is not interesting. It's actually interesting in the, in the sense that it's not interesting. <laughs> that makes sense. But essentially, the probability is zero, which sounds weird because, well, there's lots of people that are 67 inches tall. But if you were to measure them with, you know, a really, really accurate stick, imagine how often they would come exactly on the inch. Usually you're a little above or a little below, right? So what's more interesting is to calculate values or the probability of values within either above, below, or within a couple of values on the curve. So the area is a lot more significant. And what that tells you is it tells you a lot more information. So an interesting example of that would be, you know, if you're standing on the side of the road and you're watching cars go by, right? You're watching them drive along and say, okay, what's the probability that 
the car hits this spot right here at exactly 5.15 p.m. and one second, right? Imagine, especially if it's not a very traveled road, that's not very interesting, right? Uh, it, it, it'll, it'll either be 0% or 100%. But what's more interesting is you might say, okay, between 5 and 6 p.m., how many cars? Or how many blue cars, maybe, right? We're counting blue cars. A reference to an old song, right? So how many blue cars were there between those two values? Then, it, then we have some interesting data to show, okay? Anyway, so the area indicates the percentage of the population that falls within a given range. Probability that a randomly selected data value would fall between the values is actually, again, the can be interpreted that way. So again, remember percentage, probability, and area are all interchangeable in these um, examples. All right, so again, we go back to the example I showed earlier. What percentage of the values fall between A and B is an interesting question. Or what percentage uh, of the values fall between Z sub A and Z sub B? So here's some examples for that. Um, so the TI calculator is going to be the primary method for showing this. And remember that you do have your summary of statistical calculator commands at your command. Um, no pun intended. Um, on this page here that you will be allowed to use on the exam, the summary of statistical calculator commands. So you'll note that there's the binomial, which we had talked about before. and normal and inverse normal is what we're going to use for this section. So we're using the DISTR menu, right, by going second and then the VARS button. So you're going to click on the second key and then the VARS and choosing normal CDF for start. Okay, that's going to be the first one that we're going to be using. And you'll see, you'll note that the format says use the left x value to the right x value, followed by the mean and the standard deviation, all separated by commas. So there's going to be four values. And what that means is the probability that the normal variable lies between a left and right x value from a normal distribution with the specified mean and standard deviation. Note that this equals the area under the curve. Okay, so this is how we do that. So if you're interested in finding out, you know, what's the probability that it falls just to the left or just to the right, I'll show you how that works. You basically choose a really large number for the right and a really small number for the left, basically making it negative infinity or positive infinity. So here's what the picture looks like when we're calculating, you know, um, between this value here and this, you know, this value here. Anyway, and uh, if they give you the probability, okay, we use inverse norm. So if they give us the probability or it can be determined, and then we're trying to actually find the value itself, we use what's called inverse norm or inverse normal, okay? And all right, so let's go back to the PowerPoint. So what is the area of the graph? to the left of this z value. So to the left of this z value would be a particular area of the graph, which means values that are less than 1 and 3 quarters standard deviations below the mean, basically. So let's take a look at the picture again. Remember, this is the standard normal curve, where the mean is 0. So do you remember where negative 1.75 would be? about right here, right? So this is the area that we're actually finding. So can you can you estimate estimate what that area might be in your head or on paper? Would you estimate it around definitely less than 50%, yeah. Maybe around 5 5 to 10%, something like that, maybe even less, right? Sometimes it's good to estimate, even if you're wrong, because it gives you an idea, you know, of how big the answer should be. All right, so there's our negative 1.75. And if you're using a, a table, these tables can be found online. 
um, you would use a column value, which in this case is negative 1.7, and also, um, or excuse me, a row value followed by a column value. And the negative 1.7, if I add that to the 0 0.5, I get negative 1.75. And then if I find the intersection of those two values, it gives me the approximation. It looks like it's about 4%, so I was, a little, I was overestimating a little bit. But what we're going to do is use the calculator using those um, commands we talked about a minute ago. So remember it was you click on second button, followed by bars, gets you the distribution menu, go down to normal CDF, which is continuous distribution function, not normal PDF. So then normal CDF, remember there's four numbers. So here's a minute ago I was talking about, you know, when you're going forever to the left, there is no negative infinity button. So just choose, you know, negative a hundred or something like that, or negative a thousand. Um, whatever number would basically cover as much as you need it to. Okay, and then negative 1.75 is where we're going up to. So you have to do them in the correct order. This number here has to be less than that number. Remember that standard normal, so 0 and 1 are the mean and standard deviation for that distribution. So there's your 4.01%. So 4.0059% to be exact. Um, so you can round this to three significant digits, so 0401. Zero, 0401, zero, or about 4.01%. Okay, um, so what is the area to the left of positive 1.75? You could certainly do the same thing that we just did, or you could use a little bit of logic. Since we just did negative 1.75, here's positive 1.75, is it clear that this area to the left of that, which we just found, is the same as the area to the right of the, of the positive number? And if that's clear, then hopefully it'll also be clear that if I'm looking for the area to the left of positive 1.75, that it would simply be 1 minus the value that we just got. In other words, 1 minus this value. This value here that I just pointed at is the same as that value, which is this is the 0 0.0401. So this is 1 minus 0 0.0401. So 9599, I believe. I'll double check that. So I would just go 1 minus answer, and there it is, 0 0.9599. And then we could ask more questions here to the left of 1.23. I'm not going to do all of these on the calculator because you can do this yourself, but to at least draw a few of them. So remember, this is z equals 0, so there's 1.23. Again, these are not necessarily to scale, so this is the area that we're calculating. So the area should come out to be larger than 50%, which it is, it's 89%. The area to the right of 1.75, so a very, I mean, well, that's going to be 0 0.0401, which is the same as what we calculated before. So if you're doing um, the normal CDF for numbers going to the right, all you do then is you go the value, 1.75, followed by the comma, and then select a very large number. So in this case, positive 100 would be fine. And then 0 and 1. So there it is. And then the area to the right of 1.23 would be 1 minus the 0 0.8907. 1 minus 0 0.8907. 0 0.1093.
Okay, so that's the basics for the standard normal anyway. All right, now that we can find area to the left and right, how about area between? Well, this using the normal CDF, it's a piece of cake. So find the area between z values negative 0.68 and 1.82. Once again, draw your picture. There's your mean, which is 0. So negative 0.68 might be somewhere here. We'll call that z1 because I'm, I don't want to take up too much space. And then z2 is further away from 0 on the other side. So this is the area approximately that we're looking at Okay, on the calculator as before we would use second distribution normal CDF and then you would go Z1 and Z2 so negative 0 0.68 comma 1.82 again I type those in on the keyboard that's probably you didn't see me do that but you can certainly type it on the calculator which is what you normally would do um, sorry comma 0, comma, 1. There. So 71.74% approximately. 71.74%. That was actually four significant figures, so you could do 71.7% approximately. <coughs> All right. So they show it here on the, the animation. Now, if you were going to use the z-table, you could do, let's erase that so you can see what's being written here. Um, if you're going to use the z-table, you could do the area up to the right value minus the area up to the left value, which would be basically this up to the 1.82 minus this which is up to the lower value so does it stand to reason that if I just include that piece that I essentially get the same thing so if you're using a table you would subtract the values but if you're using the normal CDF you get the value directly does that make sense anyway so you can get it two different ways um, if for some reason you don't have the calculator um, then you know a table sometimes could be provided but we do require the calculator in this class so I can let you borrow one so make sure you know you, how do you use it on the calculator um, if you don't have the TI 84 or 83 remember that you there is there are apps that you can use on computers and phones and such the Wabbit W-A-B-B IT app is good for Android I'm not sure if they have it for iPhone it's wabbit.emu. So at least practice the TI-84 functions on one of those um, apps or computer programs, even if you're not using the calculator. And then when you get to the exam, you'll still know how to use it. Okay. All right. Find the area between the Z values negative 2.18 and 1.44. What do these Z values represent in terms of probability? Well, Again, I don't need to go through this because we've done a bunch of them now, but basically since the curve itself represents sample space, the shaded area represents successful outcomes. So the notation that we use here is that the probability that a randomly chosen value falls between, in other words, you know, greater than this one and less than that one, negative 2.18 and 1.44 here, and then when the calculator gives us 91%, that essentially says that a randomly chosen value between will fall has a 91 percent chance of falling in between these two values basically or that 91 percent of the values fall between those two numbers okay all right so more practice here so z is less than 1.43 there's that one greater than negative 0.81 so lots and lots of practice here Okay. Keep in mind that the probability has to be between 0 and 1. So if your answer comes out negative or more than 1, something went wrong. All right. Now we can use the standardized curve to get us actual values. All right. And remember that we're using the z-score formula. Okay. 
Um, although the normal CDF uh, makes it so you don't even have to use the z-score formula, which again is really nice. So you've got probability less than something. Okay, so that's one type of problem. And then you've got greater than something, another type. You've got between two or you've got less than one and greater than the other. Probably number four is the hardest one in terms of what we're going to be dealing with. The rest of these you, you can use the normal CDF directly. Okay, but number four involves something like you've got two values here, we've got an area here, we've got an area here. So remember that the normal CDF gives you that value, right? D, F. The normal CDF gives you the value in between them. So how would we determine the outside values? Well, it would be, whoops, it would be one minus the normal CDF value that's given. Okay. So here's a health example. Body temperatures are normally distributed with a mean temperature of 98.6 Fahrenheit and a standard deviation of 0 0.73. What is the probability of having a normal body temperature less than 96.9 degrees Fahrenheit? All right, so 98.6 is our mean. Again, if you're using a table, you can convert to a standard, but you don't have to do that. There's 96.9. Now, if it's not clear why they put it here, remember that if that's the mean and that's the standard deviation, that each of these marks represents another standard deviation. So this first one would be uh, one above, two above, three above, one below, and so on, right? So if you're trying to figure out, okay, well, what would be, you know, um, one below the mean? You could do 98.6 minus 0.73, 97.87. Okay, so that's 90. Oops, 97.87. <clears throat> and then if you were going to do that again. It's 97.14, so that goes there. And 96.9 is a little less than that. So anyway, so you can see why it's, it is where it is. So you can estimate what you think the z-score will be. But again, remember, with the normal CDF, we don't need z-scores. So anyway, um, oops. if you were calculating the z-score, you would do the 96.9 minus 98.6 for a negative 1.7 divided by the standard deviation gives us that. So it's about two and a third standard deviations below the mean. Well, there's one standard deviation below, two standard deviations below, three standard deviations below. So that does look like about two and a third below the mean. So less than that number would be those values. Or if you were doing it on the z-chart, those values. So. If you're using the normal CDF, you would just simply go second distribution, normal CDF. Again, negative, well, negative 100 would work in this case, but keep in mind that because we're using large values, um, if these values were negative 1,000, you'd have to go further down. You know. So zero would actually be okay in this case because the temperatures are way far above zero. No one's going to have a body temperature of zero. Okay. At least no one that's alive anyway. Uh, to 96.9, comma. So in this case, we're actually going to use the normal distribution values that they gave us instead of converting to z-scores. 0.73, and we get a about a 1%. So that's 0 0.0099, so 0 0.01 approximately percent probability. Um, so about 1%. <clears throat> so looking up the z-score on the table, you get that number, which is about a percent. Which should make sense, because most of us, if you check your temperature and you're normal, you're not going to be that far below, unless you're sitting in a freezer or something. 
All right, so we have a CD player example, mean of 7.1, standard deviation of 1.4. Find the probability that a randomly selected CD player will have a replacement time of less than 8.0 years. So again, drawing the picture will enable you to visualize where 8.0 is. Even, you know, what you don't want to do is just blindly plug it into the calculator because then if you just believe what the calculator says, then you know, you live and die by that answer, so to speak. But if you draw the picture, then you can usually catch mistakes. So here's 8, right? There's the value, 8.0. And standard deviation is 1.4, so one standard deviation would be a little more than that, and so on and so forth. So less than 8 years would be that value right there, or that, that area. So it looks like it's going to be more than 50%. Okay? So looks like it's about 74% there, and you can use the calculator for that. All right, a replacement time of more than nine years. Okay, so there's nine, and more than nine would be that. Yeah. So less than 10%. All righty, between five and eight. So if 7.1 is the average, and then eight was up here, Five is down there, so there's between five and eight. Okay, sixty-seven percent, and less than five point one or greater than nine point one. So what we would do here is say normal CDF um, five point one to nine point one. And the mean was 7.1. Standard deviation was 1.4. Okay, so that's the probability that the replacement time was between those two values. So now take 1 minus that, and that gives you the outer values there. So 15.31%. Okay, so that's about 0.1531. So it looks like uh, on the Z table it came out a little bit, a little bit different, and that's because of rounding. Okay. So one thing you'll want to know is if you're using the calculator, um, it'll come out a little bit different. If you're using Z table, it might come out, you know, a different number there. So you might want to just pick one method and stick with that. So the, hopefully the WAMAP questions will have enough tolerance that if you said 0.153, you'd be okay. <laughs> Resting pulses of GT patients are normally distributed with a mean of 73 beats per minute and a standard deviation of 9 beats per minute. Um, I forgot what GT stood for. At some point I knew, but <laughs> I forgot. Uh, maybe you nurses know. Anyway, so um, what is the probability of the patient chosen at random has a pulse between 80 and 90? So again, drawing the picture where the mean is 73. Standard deviation is 9, so there would be 82, 64, and so on. So 80 is about here, and 90 is about there. So there's your area. So probably less than 50% there. Not probably, definitely less than 50%. All right. What is the probability of the patient chosen at random has a pulse greater than 95? Let's see, are the answers on here? Yes, they are. Okay. So when you do these on your calculator, you should come up with 18.83%, and 0.0456. Feel free to check those. Okay. Remember that this value is 1 minus the normal CDF of 55 to 91, 73 is the mean, and 9 is the standard deviation. All right, yes. All right, and that concludes this video. Thank you for sticking with it. I know it was long.